Today I'm starting to make my own video game. And this is gonna be the first devlog. Let's not waste any time. The game is gonna be a hardcore platformer and uh, that's it. Look, we're gonna figure out other things later. For now, let's add simple platformer mechanics. Here I wrote the standard game loop that runs the game at 60 frames per second. I'm using the Chrono library to make the game frame rate independent so that it runs the same way on different PCs. I'm also using the SFML for the graphics. And it works! Yeah, you don't see it, but it works. Just trust me. Anyway, now we need to add the player, so I made a player class. We're loading the player image and drawing it on the screen. The player image is just a white square, so it's working. But we all know that you can't draw a white square on the screen and call it a game. The player needs to somehow interact with it. So I added this code to make the player move left and right. You know, you can just check the boolean value itself. You don't have to write shh. It's okay. No, I mean like it's redundant, you can just remove it and it'll shh. I said, it's okay. Alright, as you can see, we can now move the player. Now let's improve it. First, we find the direction the player wants to go by using this formula. It returns 1 when we press the right key, minus 1 when we press the left key, and 0 if we press both or neither of them. Then we multiply the result by the player's movement speed to get the target speed. After that, we just change the player's current speed by the acceleration rate in order to reach that target. I know it sounds complicated, but as you can see from the code, it's very simple. I also wrote my own sign function because the standard library doesn't have it. I decreased the acceleration rate just so you can see the difference. Now we're gonna add a map so I drew this large level. Then I made a map manager class which will do everything related to maps. Like always, we're loading the level by converting every pixel in our map sketch into a cell. We're storing those cells in a two-dimensional vector. I'll probably change this later because it's too unpractical. Maybe I'll finally use the tiled map editor. For now, we're just gonna stick with the things we know. Now we need to add gravity, reverse gravity, also known as jumping, and collision checking. First, I took the collision checking function from my Mario project and removed the things we don't need. The function takes a hitbox and a list of types of cells to check. Then we check every cell on the map that's intersecting with the given hitbox. Once we find an intersecting cell that's included in our list, we return 1, otherwise we return 0. Now when it comes to jumping, we're simply checking if the player is standing on the ground and if their vertical speed is 0. If one of these conditions is false, we increase the vertical speed by gravity. And for the movement itself, I made a new, better movement algorithm. The previous algorithm we used in the Mario project had two disadvantages. First, it worked with only one square hitbox that was the same size as the cells. Second, if the distance was higher than the cell size, it would skip the cells on its way and only check the destination point. Our new algorithm, on the other hand, moves the hitbox by the cell size until it reaches the destination or hits something on its way. It also works with any hitbox. I wrote a move function because the movement algorithm is pretty much the same for both directions except for the variables. Then I used pointers to use the correct variables based on the given direction to check. You could write something better than that, you know? You could just shut up about my stupidity, you know? Anyway, now our player can jump and move around the map. Next, I figured that our main file is getting bigger and messier. So I decided to make a game plus and divide the main code into functions. And now our main file looks like this. This may seem unnecessary and maybe it is, but I thought that's what smart people do. Anyway, now we need to make the camera follow the player. First I introduced new variables for the camera and its target. Then I made a function called update camera which will surprisingly update the camera. The camera will move in three different ways. First one is called instant. It just sets the camera's position to the target. Second one is called follow. It moves the camera to the target at a constant speed. And the third one is called lerp because it uses linear interpolation. The lerp function returns an interpolation between two numbers for a parameter t. So if the t is 0, it returns the first number. If it's 1, it returns the second number. And if it's 0.5, it returns a number halfway between these two. So in our case, the first number is the camera's current position and the second number is the target. We'll get the distance between them and move the camera by 10% of it. Then we'll do the same thing using the new distance. And as a result, the camera moves slower the closer it is to the target. The camera's target will be the player's center. I also went a bit crazy and added namespaces to global variables and functions. Alright, this is the instant movement, this is the follow movement, and this is the lerp movement. We're gonna stick with the last one. Now let's make sure that the camera doesn't go beyond the map. First we need to know the dimensions of the map so I added these two functions. We're gonna use the clamp function to limit the camera's position. The clamp function takes three numbers as inputs. The number we wanna clamp, the lower limit, and the upper limit. If the number is lower than the lower limit, it returns the lower limit. If it's higher than the upper limit, it returns the upper limit. And if the number is between the limits, it returns the number itself. I also did the getbox function which returns a visual hitbox of the player. You might be asking what the hell does that even mean? Imagine this is our player and this is his hitbox. If we use this hitbox to calculate the camera's position for example, the center of the hitbox won't be the center of the player, visually. 
so we need to use a different hitbox that represents the player's appearance. Alright, this is good. Now let's work on sprites. In the Mario project, every entity had its own texture and sprite, which is super inefficient. Because that meant that if there were 10 Goombas on the screen, we had 10 identical textures in our memory. What I want to do instead is to have a sprite manager class that will store all the textures and sprites. And if an entity wants to draw a sprite on the screen, it'll call the sprite manager class and say, Hey, I want you to draw this frame, of this sprite, at this location. Along with the texture image, each sprite will have a sprites file which will contain the sprite data. This includes the name of the sprite, its origin coordinates, its size, its location in the texture, and the total number of frames. I'm using the fstream library to read the sprites file. Let's first make sure that we load the data correctly by printing it on the console. And just so you know, I also wanted to divide the sprites into static images and animations, but I later got rid of that idea. Okay, it's working. Now in order to store those numbers, I made a sprite data struct. Then I decided to make an unordered map of sprite datas. That way we can access each sprite's data by using its name. We're not using the regular map because we don't care about the ordering of the elements and we need a quick access to each element. And here we're reading the data file line by line and adding it into our map. And as you can see the numbers match. Now let's actually draw the sprites. Here's the function which does exactly that. We're just giving it the name of the sprite and the position on the screen to draw it. The function uses the given name to use the correct data. We can also flip the sprite vertically and horizontally if we want to. Alright, we're gonna draw this sprite of the wall. I wrote 16 because it's 16 by 16 pixels. I don't know what's the point of that. I just saw other game devs doing it. Anyway, our code is working. Now it's time we add animations. I took the animation class from my previous project and slightly changed it. Instead of storing textures and sprites, we're just storing the name of the sprite we're gonna draw. And we're now using floating numbers to make things easier. Now in order to test the code, we need to draw and animate the player. And to do that, we need to know the story of the game. Because we can't just throw anything and say this is our player. At first I was thinking about making a fantasy world. You know, trolls, warlocks and dragons. But I later figured that I don't know much about that. However, I do know a lot about computers. So why not make a game about that? Hmm... Hmm... It's done. Alright, after some thinking I got the game story right here. Ahem. <laughs> We're gonna play as a malware and our job is to destroy the PC while avoiding the anti-malware software. Yeah. Anyway, here's the player's idle animation. Hey, this guy looks like Super Me- Dude, that's clearly Super Me- Alright, let's check it. Well, this is bad. Okay, I set up this large console output to figure out the problem. Oh, look at that. It's changing its memory address. Apparently, when you add a new element to the vector, C++ moves the whole vector to a new address in the memory. So we need to either acknowledge this change in our code or don't change the size of the vector. I chose the second option because it's easier. First I included the file system library. Then I used it to go to the folder where we stored the textures and sprites and printed all the file names on the console. We only have two textures for now so it's working. Now we're just gonna count the total number of textures in the folder and resize our vector by that amount. That way we'll just change the existing elements instead of adding new ones. Alright, we fixed it. Now we need to add walking, jumping and landing animations. Here's the walking animation, jumping animation, and landing a uh, frame, a single frame. Since we're squishing and stretching the player, we're using the origins to position the jumping sprites correctly. Also in the walking animation, these frames are the exact copies of these frames, just in reverse order. So we can just remove them and change the frames like this. Similar to how tennis players play table tennis. That's why it's called ping pong animation. Anyway, here's the player's spreadsheet. And here's the sprite data. After some trial and error, I wrote this code. I would love to explain it to you, but I really doubt I understood it myself. Then I added the state machine to the player. As soon as the player switches from the jumping state to the idle state, we'll show the landing sprite for a couple of frames. And here's the current state of the player's draw function. Phew, now that was tough. But look at this, it looks so smooth. Now we're gonna add something that every platformer game has that you probably didn't even notice. I'm talking about the coyote time. Let's imagine a player running on a platform and he wants to jump at the very edge of it. So he needs to press the jump button right here. But as we all know, the human species are not perfect. Because the average reaction time of a human is about a quarter of a second. And just so you know how long this is. Ha! That was a quarter of a second. Anyway, when the player is about to reach the edge, it'll take him 15 frames to process that information and press the jump button. But the player will already be falling so he won't jump. Now do you really think the player will say, Oh no, I didn't press the jump button quick enough. That's fine, I'll just try again. No, no, no. What he'll actually say is, Are you kidding me? I pressed the jump button, you 
So to prevent that from happening, we're gonna add the coyote time. Basically after the player leaves the ground, we'll start a timer. And while the timer is on, the player can jump in the air. There is also a reverse coyote time for when the player presses the jump button before hitting the ground. I slowed down the game for demonstration. Here I reach the edge, now I'm falling, but if I press the jump key, the player jumps even though we're in the air. Since we're making a platformer, it makes sense that we should add spikes. But we're not gonna add them, because spikes in platformers are too cliche. And they also take one extra space for a block. So what are we gonna add instead? This! It's supposed to represent the anti-malware software. I called it a malware trap. For now they serve only as decorations. Nothing will happen if we touch them. Let's change that. First I added the restart function for the game class. It will load the level, calls the player's reset function, and updates the camera. Here's the player's reset function if you're curious. Now if I press the restart button, the game restarts. And for the player's death, I added a new state called dying. Once the player collapses with the malware trap, we'll switch to that state. During that state, we'll draw the death animation. Now drawing the death animation was a bit hard. First I wanted to just shrink it out of existence, but that looked boring. Then I decided to make it disappear pixel by pixel. That was better but still not good. So instead of deleting the pixels, I made them fall. Now that looked a lot better. And after adding a little flash, here's the final animation. This looks so good. I also fixed the ping pong animation code. Previously we changed the frames like this, but that caused the first and the last frames to be drawn twice. After thinking about this, I decided to virtually double the total number of frames. Then we'll just play it like a regular animation. And for the virtual frames, we'll just use this formula to get the correct frame. Alright, we're finished with the main gameplay. Now there's only one problem left to fix, which is... Why would anyone play this game? There's nothing that makes the game unique. I thought about this for a while. First of all, what makes the platformer game a platformer? Obviously it's jumping. We made it so that the player can jump only when he's standing on the ground. But what if we remove that limit? I don't know what I was expecting. When we press the jump key, we're setting the player's vertical speed to be minus 8. And in the next frame we're still pressing it so we're setting it to minus 8 again. This keeps happening until we release the key. The fix is we just need to check the jump key only once. For that we're gonna remember the previous state of the jump key. If the jump key wasn't pressed in the previous frame and is pressed in the current frame, we're gonna jump. Otherwise we won't. We also don't need the coyote time anymore. Alright, now we have the main selling point. Now let's make more levels. The level design is gonna be a challenge now because the player has more freedom. So even if we design a complicated level, the player can simply jump over it like this. And the platforms lost their main purpose so now they just serve as a place to rest your fingers. With that in mind, I made three levels. And to transition between them, I added a goal cell. When the player collapses with that cell, we're gonna change the current level and restart the game. Then the restart function will use that variable when loading a level. I also changed the tiles to make the game look a little better. Here's the first level. Here's the second level. As you can see we didn't have to use this platform right here. And here's the third level. This is harder than it looks. Yes, I did it! Overall the game looks promising. The idea is interesting, the controls are smooth, the levels are challenging. Stop praising yourself. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this first devlog. I probably won't release the playable version for now. It's too early for that. But if you want, I made it available on my Patreon page. Thank you to all these people who already supported me there. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to join our Discord server where you can talk with other programmers. And be sure to like and subscribe. Alright, now I can talk about...